happen. Um, anyway, so uh, I really started getting into theological questions through the door of um, issues relating to Genesis, uh, creation, and evolution. I was raised uh, a Christian, um, kind of young age creation was my default. I still remember vividly at about six years old realizing that believing that dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago was in tension with believing that the world was created about 6,000 years ago. And other people talked about that same experience. You had these two things in your head, and then one day you realize, wait a second, these two things don't actually go together. So that was kind of my default. Um, when I was uh, 13, 13 years old, I went to a church class, which was very balanced, presented multiple perspectives. But, you know, especially at that age, um, there are certain things that you just kind of latch onto for whatever reason. And I kind of latched onto the issue of uh, theistic evolution evolution. Um, I got really into evolutionary biology. Um, I got really into the kind of polemical internet aspect of arguing with people about creation and evolution. Uh, and I permanently embedded the consciousness of my 13-year-old self before my voice dropped. So I sounded kind of like this um, into the collective consciousness of the human race. So that is a, a great benefit to all mankind. Um, but uh, through that, I actually got into questions of apologetics because getting, because getting into the issue of um, creation and evolution is naturally going to bring you into contact with people who question whether Christianity is true to begin with. And I really valued not so much Christianity, but the person of Jesus. I'd been uh, kind of raised on the Jesus film, which you may or may not be familiar with. I'm sure some of you have probably seen it. It's this film that came out in the 70s. It was recorded on site in Israel. It's based entirely on the Gospel of Luke. Every word spoken, it is from the Gospel of Luke. And that kind of brought me into kind of, um, uh, uh, I really valued at a, at a deep level the person of Jesus however my theology may have changed throughout the years and so it was kind of devastating to realize that I didn't have an answer to the question well why do I actually think Christianity is true um, one of the passages from uh, scripture that has resonated with me in capturing that experience is they have taken my Lord away and I do not know where they have laid him um, because it kind of everything falls apart um, I didn't know whether there was any purpose or meaning or anything at all in the world. And very kind of gradually, step by step, um, God enabled me to, to um, kind of claw my way back. Um, I got into apologetics. I started kind of engaging with uh, natural positive interpretation in the sense that it has positive content about what the world is. You know, some people say that atheists don't make any claims, but no, they do. They claim that the universe, as the universe, is a self-perpetuating um, uh, sustenance. When we say that God is creator, we're not just talking about him having created the world sometime in the past. We're talking about the reality that at every moment he is actively and intentionally sustaining the world in what it is. And so when we say the world doesn't have to exist, this isn't just something about the, someone had to get the world started. It's something about why does the world continue to exist now? And so a naturalist is someone who believes that the universe is self-perpetuating, that at the deepest level, it doesn't require anything external to itself to continue to exist. That's why I prefer um, that term. Um, as I got back into um, a kind of stable Christian faith, uh, I got very into questions of the historicity of the New Testament, to some degree the historicity of the Old Testament, as I mentioned, Christian apologetics and stuff like that. I got into various theological questions, and I kind of bracketed in terms of how often I thought about it, the issue of evolution. I still believed that evolution, as it was articulated by um, the, the, the scientific consensus, was true. I believed that the uh, Earth was four and a half billion years old. The universe is about 13.7 uh, billion years old. Um, and I assumed that, you know, in time, some of the questions that I was having about whether these are really reconcilable things would be resolved. So the problem is, over the years, I noticed that certain questions that I had about Christianity, they would get easier and easier and easier. As I learned new things, I would often be reading a book on a completely different subject, and I'd stumble across a piece of information that would help me answer a question that I've been wondering about for years. So almost everything was becoming more and more coherent, more and more elegantly um, integrated in light of the revelation of Christ. 
But this question became more and more difficult. The more that I learned about the history of Christianity, the more I learned about scripture, the more I learned about how to interpret the Bible well, the more difficult it was for me to believe that um, theistic evolution was the best option from a theological and biblical point of view. It was very difficult for me to understand how we could take Genesis 1 to 11 as anything other than an historical narrative if we wanted to preserve the historical sense of the rest of the Bible, especially Genesis um, 12 to 50. Uh, some people say that there is a very sharp distinction between Genesis 1 to 11 and Genesis 12 to 50. Um, I don't agree with that. I think that if you look at Genesis 12 to 50, you'll notice that the world there is, it's in certain respects, kind of in between the world we read about in Genesis 1 to 11 and the world we experience today. For example, um, the patriarchs, while they're not as long lived as Noah and um, uh, his forefathers were, they're still relatively long lived. Jacob dies at 147 years old. I believe Abraham dies at 205 years old. Uh, and even someone like Job, who I think is living around the time of Moses, dies at 140 years old. So there's still a um, a difference between the world that we experienced and the world that was going on then. And it made it very hard to create the sharp distinction between Genesis 1 to 11 and Genesis 12 to 50. Um, another major issue, which I was finding more and more difficult to resolve was the issue of death. So obviously, if you think that uh, the fossils that we find in the sedimentary record are very, very ancient and preceded man, um, at the least we know about them is that these are dead creatures. But it seemed clear to me that uh, scripture not only said as a matter of fact that there was no death prior to the fall, but that the reason that it gave for that was very important for how we understand what Christ does for us and for the entire cosmos. Um, in Romans 8, Paul says that the whole creation is waiting for the revelation of the children of God. When it says that God made man in his image, context. Textually, what we're reading about is God's work of creating and sustaining and developing the world. God has placed man over the world. He has uh, come into the world as the man, as Jesus Christ. He has become the head over all things in the world through the church and through mankind. And so it seemed that uh, in the structure and the wiring of creation in the biblical vision of reality that God intended to communicate life and glory and immortality to all creation through mankind. So as man goes, so goes creation. And it was very difficult to understand how we could have prior to the fall, a creation which was already uh, permeated by bloodshed and violence and death. And in addition to that, there's simply the intuitive um, reaction to uh, a lot of what we see in so-called natural evil. I remember one of my earliest nightmares um, when I was three or four years old was being forced to watch a rabbit get eaten by a wolf. There's something that's intuitively horrifying about watching a deer get, getting ripped apart violently by predators as its parents look on wailing. Uh, I remember when I was in Africa once, um, we saw uh, lions, this is quite unusual, um, they ate a hippo and the, hippo, the um, family of that hippo, because it was a young one, uh, was down in the river below and you could hear them wailing over the death of their, um, of their uh, child. Um, and it seems clear this is not something that God built into the world as an intrinsic aspect of its character. It is a wound on creation. And that fact that it is a wound on creation gives us confidence that the wound is healed through Christ by the agency of the church. Now, all of those issues were issues that I was wrestling with as a theistic evolutionist. So by the time I became a creationist, my theological arguments against theistic evolution were already kind of crystallized in my mind. And I was becoming increasingly, um, I guess the word is frustrated with the, what I perceived at least as the flippancy of certain theistic evolutionists in dismissing the significance of these questions or saying to young age creationists, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. This is just a modern issue. Um, uh, there aren't really any theological issues, but I didn't want there to be theological issues because I accepted evolution, but I just felt that there genuinely were those issues. What got me um, uh, to begin really considering whether I had been mistaken about this began with certain things I was learning about 
the Bible. So biblical criticism, the, the um, kind of scholarly study of scripture, um, as I was working through the Bible and trying to learn how to interpret not just the passages we all know, but the strange bits in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and just the bizarre passages like passages which say uh, um, the angel of the Lord touched the socket of Jacob's thigh and said, therefore, the Israelites do not eat the meat that is in the socket of the thigh because the angel of the Lord touched Jacob in the socket of the thigh. Like, well, of course, the angel of the Lord touched touch Jacob in the socket of the thigh, of course the Israelites wouldn't eat the meat there. There's something that's missing in our understanding of the world because the biblical author perceives that as a very um, straightforward implication. But when we read that, we're kind of like, what? So there's all sorts of stuff in scripture that I was, I was <laughs> trying to figure out. And um, as I was doing that, I began to have less and less confidence in the credibility of what one might call the mainstream academy. So my father is an academic. He's a historian. I um, have spent a lot of time in the academic world. I have a huge amount of respect for the accomplishments of the academy and scholars, but I don't place a great deal of what one might call epistemic weight on consensus in and of itself. So you will often hear people say, and, and Christians do it when it's convenient, just like anyone else does well the majority of scholars say x or, or the majority of scientists say y um but you cannot have an argument which has only one premise that's just a fact okay the majority of scholars say x what are we supposed to take from that are we supposed to take that uh, x is more likely than not to be true well maybe but in order to make that argument, one would have to say and actually argue for the idea that if the majority of scholars say X, then X is more likely than not to be true. And you, you could make that argument if you wanted, but it's a contest. But as I was learning <laughs> things about the Bible, I began to encounter in biblical criticism, I began to encounter in biblical criticism um, a reality that many of the things that were being said were just based not on a mistake of fact, not on a subtle um, accident in logic, but on kind of just blatant, obvious errors in reading the text. So here's an example. There's one website created by a biblical scholar. Uh, it's called Contradictions in the Bible. And it's not just about kind of vague contradictions in the Bible. It's arguing that, you know, the Pentateuch and the prophets have multiple authors. And this was, uh, these were all contradictory texts and they were put together in one book much later in history. So with the Pentateuch, this is what's associated with the so-called documentary hypothesis, if you're, uh, if you're familiar with that at all. Um, and one of the first posts that he had on this website was a post pointing out the two contradictory genealogies of Noah. One of them is in Genesis 4, one of them is in Genesis 5. Now, Genesis 4 is not a genealogy of Noah. It doesn't have Noah there. Noah is not present there. But he has them listed side by side. And he makes a very crucial argument based on this idea that Genesis 4 is a genealogy of Noah, but it's not. And when this was pointed out to him in the comments, he kind of, you know, hemmed and hawed and accused the person who was criticizing him of being a fundamentalist. And it was just, it was an argument that was based on um, a clear mistake in looking at the basic features of the text. And so I began to lose confidence in the credibility of the academy in telling me what was more likely than not to be true. And I thought perhaps this is true with respect to the scientific issues as well. Not definitely. But I should at least be open to it. Perhaps scientific consensus shouldn't mean as much to me as it does at this point in time. Um, and then I encountered uh, the reality that all across the world, you find um, flood traditions, traditions of a universal flood. Now, many people are familiar with things like the Epic of Gilgamesh. Sometimes this is cited as an argument against the historicity of the flood. They say, well, clearly the biblical author is borrowing from the Southern Near Eastern account. And that would be a good argument if you didn't find flood traditions elsewhere in the world. Because if there really were a universal flood, and if all human beings are descended from the family who experienced that flood, you would in fact expect there to be traditions and memories of that flood in the Near East, but also outside the Near East. And so usually what is said in response to this is, well, floods happen everywhere. Well, so of course people have traditions or stories or legends of a universal flood because floods happen everywhere and they come up with these uh, legendary accounts. And that sounds plausible. But then I began to actually read the traditions of a universal flood. And I realized 
that is just not a viable interpretation of what is happening here. For example, in um, uh, uh, in uh, countless um, flood traditions in China and in ancient America and in old world India, the tradition is that near the end of the flood, the flood hero sends a bird off the ark or the ship, whatever they call it in the tradition, in order to see if there is land. And very often the bird is going to return with a olive branch or some kind of branch in his beak. Now, that is not explained by floods happen everywhere because that's far too specific a detail. Mm -hmm. Or in the native Hawaiian tradition about the flood, the flood hero is named Nu'u. And in scripture, uh, the way that you pronounce Noah's name is Nuach. And it's very interesting because Nuach is a Hebrew name. The Hawaiian language has nothing to do with Hebrew. And yet it sounds like the personal name of the flood hero has some kind of connection with the um, actual figure who's described for us in scripture. And as I began to look at the details of these accounts, and as I began to search for alternative explanations for why these stories are there, I began to see that really there was no serious attempt to account for this data other than kind of generically saying, well, floods happen everywhere. In the Oxford Study Bible, which is, you know, based on a very, very secular interpretation of what scripture is, um, to its credit, it mentions in the notes that there are flood traditions all around the world. And because what it is saying is the biblical author is clearly borrowing from a Near Eastern story. But then it goes on to say, however, there are these flood traditions all around the world. And then it just punts to geology. It says, but we know that this can't have anything to do with the biblical story because geology doesn't allow. Oh, and it's like, well, excuse me, this is, that's not the issue at hand. Whatever the geological issues are, let's talk about what this particular line of evidence implies. And then I began to see that this was not just true with respect to the flood. This is true with respect to everything in Genesis 1 to 11. Um, there is a Native American tradition that um, the great spirit, which is their name for the supreme God, who created the world, who sent, a, who sent a flood to punish the world for its evil, that the great spirit made woman from the dust of the ground, put her into a deep sleep, took man from her side, and then joined them back together. Now, that's obviously related to the stuff that we read about in Genesis chapter 2. And what's especially interesting about all of these traditions relating to Genesis 1 to 11 is that many of them agree on details which are not actually present in scripture. So for example, um, there are many traditions about a great tower or a cosmic tree from which the world's languages and nations were born and from which the nations were dispersed. And again and again, if you look at these traditions, you're going to find that there's a great wind, which is mentioned at the very end of it. Uh, in um, an Aboriginal Australian tradition, the idea is that there was a cosmic tree. All the world's peoples were gathered there. And then a great wind came and shook the languages of the world out of it. Now, Josephus, who's a jo Jewish historian of the first century, gives us a lot of the Jewish traditions about the biblical stories. He gives us additional information about what happened. And Josephus tells us that what happened was they were building the Tower of Babel. A great wind came in the middle of the night, knocked over the Tower of Babel, it woke everybody up, and they couldn't understand each other's languages. Now, a person could make the argument that, well, maybe missionaries went all over the world, and they were so influential, even when they didn't convert anybody, that they implanted these biblical stories in the memory of their oral traditions. But there is just no way to make the argument that they were also vigorously preaching this obscure tradition found in the writings of Josephus. If these are historical events, there are things that happened, which are not given us in scripture, but happened in history. And some of those things are remembered across the world, just like the details recorded in scripture are corroborated from traditions across the world. Now, this was very striking to me because it gave the scriptural um, account a kind of concreteness that it had lacked when I wasn't familiar with these features of mankind's collective memory. It made it um, very kind of sharply real, the idea that this is actually the real history of the human race. And that in fact, whether or not people had been evangelized, whether or not they lived before or after the time of Christ, people remembered this stuff. Some things we're so used to taking for granted that I don't think we realize just how striking they are. Sacrifice is a weird thing. I mean, it's a weird thing to build an altar, take an animal, slit its throat, pour out its blood on the altar, and act like you're doing something of cosmic significance. It's not something you would just come up with out of nowhere. And yet, all across the world, 
people have this idea of sacrificial altars, blood sacrifice, priesthood, temples, sanctuaries, and the like. All across the world, you find that the temples are structured in similar ways. They're structured as stepped pyramids. Um, pyramids where, you know, you go up uh, step by step, and often there's nine steps. The earliest Egyptian pyramids are, in fact, stepped pyramids. That's also what a ziggurat looks like. That's what the Tower of Babel um, was. So there are these features that are shared in common among the world's cultures, which gave the biblical narrative a kind of credibility. But I knew from experience and from my own study that most creationist scientific arguments were just bad. Most creationist scientific arguments, especially ones which kind of made fun of the idea of evolution, which made fun of the scientific consensus, which basically said, oh, that's all stupid. Uh, there's no real reason to believe that. I knew that that had no credibility. So I, um, uh, and that's something which has been very damaging, I think, to young age um, creationist um, uh, research and to the popular perception of young age creationism. And it's something which stops a lot of people who might want to be young age creationists from seriously considering that. Um, so I sent an email to a uh, young age creationist geologist, so who believes the world is 6,000 years old, who believes in the universal flood, but had become kind of infamous in the young age creationist community for excoriating other young earthers for making bad arguments because he said, look, we're Christians, we have to value truth, we have to value honesty, we have to be serious and credible in the kinds of arguments that we made. And what that meant is he wasn't willing to accept easy arguments that sound good but actually don't have credibility. But now he is not so much in because he invested a lot of intellectual energy in trying to construct viable models of earth history and of the scientific data that um, cohere with what we read about in scripture. I sent him an email and he wrote back a very extensive and extremely helpful email giving me a list of books that he thought were credible, um, giving me a list of resources to consult. And um, as I've kind of pursued the issues, uh, having started with um, his recommended reading list. Um, I've become more and more excited about the kinds of things um, and the kinds of answers that we can give um, that help us substantiate or explain the, uh, 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 the actual scientific evidence in the light of what we know about um, biblical history. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things on that, and then we can get to some of the questions. Um, one of the things that I find most striking is that if you look at the sedimentary record, um, the sedimentary record has very different features depending on where you are. And so um, after the Precambrian period, the Precambrian period basically has fossils of single cells. It's a very strange um, period of the sedimentary record, but the Cambrian period uh, begins to show us kind of large bodied animal fossils. And so from the Cambrian to the present, scientists have structured the sedimentary record into basically three parts. So the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary, right, which are the names I'm going to use for it. They're also called the, uh, um, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Kenozoic, but primary, secondary, tertiary is easy to remember. Um, and these are not of the same quality. The primary and secondary sedimentary layers display certain characteristics which are not true of any other sedimentary layers. So one of the most prominent examples of this is um, you can find the same chalk bed formation in Europe and North America, and you will find that there is a sandstone that, that has the same kind of features over hundreds or thousands of square miles. In other words, we're dealing with very large-scale patterns of deposition here. Something is happening on a very substantial level. And what's so significant about this is we can observe sedimentation today. We see rocks being formed and deposited and so forth. And we know that that's not how things are working. We also can look at the tertiary layers, which is what conventionally is interpreted as having begun with the extinction of the dinosaurs leading all the way down to the present. And we find that sedimentation is happening at a very local level there as well. So something is happening in the primary and secondary layers that is not happening today, that is not happening in the tertiary layers, and it's happening on a scale of thousands and thousands of square miles. Another feature of this data, which is really significant, is what is called paleocurrents. A paleocurrent is basically when you look at the orientation of a particular rock or fossil or what have you, and you can see that it's deposited in a particular direction. You can see that when the landslide comes down, the landslide is moving in a particular direction. And you can look at these data and you can then compile them together. You look at the data in, let's say, Colorado and Arizona and Utah and California, you can see, are there large scale trends here? 
or is it just um, relatively random? Well, over 500,000 of these individual data points have now been compiled. And if you model them on a computer, you can actually see large scale currents that are flowing across extremely wide uh, spans of land. And this is very um, straightforwardly intelligible. If there is a global event which is creating these formations, it's very hard to explain if each of these individual fossils is being deposited hundreds of thousands or even millions of years apart from each other. You shouldn't see that they have any kind of relationship like this. And what's really quite striking, I think, about this data is that the gentlemen who have compiled it and made this argument have done so cordially, have done so respectfully, and have done so in engagement with and in recognition of the accomplishments of their secular peers who don't agree with them on creationism. But when you talk to people like they're human beings, it turns out they can be quite willing to hear you. So this data has actually been published in the mainstream scientific literature um, because it's an interesting data point, even if people don't agree that there was a global flood or anything like that. Um, and uh, it's been presented to uh, the secular scientific community. And, um, uh, and I think that's, that's an object lesson just for the way that we ought to engage with people who don't agree with us because people can be a lot more open-minded than you would imagine that uh, they would be. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that could be said about model building and the scientific argument back and forth. But I wanna make one last point on principle then we'll kick to questions. There are really two kinds of creationist literature, one of which I'm not a fan of at all and the other which uh, other of which I, I, I very much enjoy. Uh, the first one is kind of designed to refute evolution or to refute the idea that there's an ancient earth. Um, it is developed essentially for an apologetic purpose. Now I'm of the conviction that good apologetics, good defenses of Christianity um, are only really produced when you're interested in a subject for its own sake. That is, you're not uh, doing your research in order to make an argument, but the good arguments that you can make are produced when you just become interested in a subject and want to study it and learn about God's world. And as you learn about it, it begins to display certain features to you. You begin to understand it more deeply and you're able to communicate that in an intelligible way to people who don't agree with you about a particular issue or even about uh, Christianity itself. So many of the arguments that are designed to refute evolution or something like that, I don't think are presented well. I don't think um, in many cases they're presented respectfully. Um, and I, I think in their substance, they're often uh, not very good. But another approach is to not see this as an apologetic endeavor. We're not trying to refute atheists primarily. We're not trying to prove creation. What we're trying to do is understand God's world. That's what we want to do. Uh, Solomon says in Proverbs 25, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the glory of kings to search them out. Uh, Revelation says we've all been priests and kings to God the Father and Jesus Christ. And if you think about why God would structure the world that way, when you really have to work at things, when you have to think about it a lot, you're going to remember it a lot better because it's always bopping around in your head. If God just gave us an outline of what he wanted to, us to know, and it was really straightforward. You didn't really need to study it. We would read it over once. We think we'd get it. We never study it again. But the Bible is a, a bizarre book. And that means that if you really want to understand it, you've got to spend lots and lots and lots and lots of time in it, which means it's going to work its way into you. Jesus talks about truth as not something which is easy to find. It's something which is hidden. It's something which is buried in a field. It's the pearl of great price. Well, creation is that way as well. Um, creation in all of its aspects, not just in relation to origins issues, but in relation to the entire scientific endeavor. It is designed in such a way that we can learn things about it, but the only way to learn, learn things about it are to really throw oneself into it because creation is beautiful and because it is something which is worth understanding for its own sake, even if there was no such thing as an atheist, even if there was no such thing as evolutionary biology, it would still be worth studying because it's interesting and because it's beautiful. And so I think the most productive way of looking at the scientific issues is not about creating good arguments against evolution or whatnot. Um, evolutionary biologists have a lot of really interesting things to say, and a lot of what they say is actually true and can be true within a biblical framework. Um, but what we ought to be doing, what, what the most productive path, I think, is to try to construct a comprehensive model for how the world works that is coherent with a biblical history.
So there, there are many different models of how the flood might work, or many different models of how we get the animal forms that we see uh, living today that are compatible with a biblical paradigm. It is not as if, as some people say, well, if we're committed to the historicity of scripture, we already have the answer, so no interesting question to ask. No, there's lots of interesting questions to ask because there are many different ways in which the world can be understood coherently um, with scripture. Um, and so that model building approach has been very, very productive um, uh, within the creationist community. And today, um, it, it's a very exciting time, I think, within creationist research. Um, if any of you, I don't know if any of you saw it, there was a documentary called Is Genesis History, um, which I was very excited by because it came out a few years after I had become a creationist and it kind of compiled all of the people who I think are really credible on this issue, who are very good and present the best kind of interpretations of what the data looks like in light of a biblical um, perspective. And um, uh, is Genesis history. They're now producing multiple films in that series. If you go to their YouTube channel, they've got, um, I think, well over 100 hours of lectures just filmed with good information. Um, so that's what I have to say in opening. I do tend to go on and on, so forgive me for that. So uh, let me take a look at the questions here. <clears throat> 